harms or passion? How do we approach our worship on the Sunday before Easter? There are actually two sets of lectionary readings set for today, reflecting two distinct approaches. The liturgy of the palms is festive, reminding us of the joy and the celebration when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. The liturgy of the passion is more sombre, with our gospel readings extending right through the events of Holy Week. Looking back on the many Palm Sunday services that I have led over the years, my focus has almost invariably been on processions and palms. And yet we know that within days of entering Jerusalem on a donkey, Jesus is going to stagger through those same streets with a cross. And maybe we don't care to be reminded that the crowd cried Hosanna, only to shout crucify hours later. Maybe we don't like to imagine that we too might bless the king when things are going our way, but mockingly hail the king of the Jews when our illusions are challenged. Or perhaps we prefer not to think of Judas' betrayal and Peter's denial, knowing how our own faith can fail and falter. I am aware that this year, of course, it's going to be difficult again for us to attend our usual Holy Week services. And so this morning we are now going to set our palms aside and pursue the Passion Liturgy. The lectionary starts at Mark chapter 14 and takes us right through to the end of Mark chapter 15. We're not going to read it all the way through in one go. Instead, we're breaking up the story with song and prayer and reflection along the way. And so we begin and the passion story commences with an act of preparation carried out with great love. Now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. While he was in Bethany reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor, and they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you. And you can help them any time you want. But you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. She was broken at your feet, like an alabaster jar. Every piece of who she was laid before your majesty. Her life bowed at your feet. Her lips lost for words, kissing your feet, kissing your feet.
of the most expensive gift of all, help us to learn from you. May we who are so adept at catering for our own wants, make ourselves more vulnerable to the needs of others. Let us live unselfishly, more sensitively, that we may spread love's fragrance wherever the odour of cynicism and despair hangs in the air. Amen. Oh,